Okay, welcome everyone. Um, thank you very much for coming into this meeting. Today we are going to look into the tidyverse collection, and we are going to emphasize on two of the most important packages of the tidyverse, which include the tidyr and the dplyr. So, a little bit about an introduction to who I am. My name is Elijah Pia, and I'm from Ghana, West Africa. I am an economist by profession, and I really love R. In economics, there is an axiom of consumer behavior, which is referred to as the law of transitivity. And typically, we would like to compare uh, three commodities. And so we would say, if you prefer commodity A to B, and you prefer B to C, then it follows that you prefer commodity A to C. So if you look at the three terms I have put there with the arrows in between, I'm just trying to say that I prefer R to raw data. Because once you know R, you're able to process data and you would never enjoy having raw data, right? So I prefer R to raw data and I really prefer raw data to leisure because if I have raw data, then I am most motivated to go into R. So technically, I love R than leisure. If you want to reach me, that is my email right there. And I am always smiling. And so um, I used to say that if anybody asks me why I am always smiling, then I tell them that I'm confident because I really know R, one of the most difficult statistical programming languages in the world. The goal for this lesson is to provide you with an impactful guide to two important packages of the tidyverse, which are used for data manipulation, and they are the tidy R and the dplyr. R. And so the tidyverse collection is simply R's most powerful packages that have been put together to perform some functionality, and those functionalities include the data manipulation, data analysis and data visualization so which means if we're able to create some kind of expertise in the tidyverse then there is virtually you can do virtually anything when it comes to data all right data analysis and all of that you can do everything with that and you would always be able to process raw data to generate meaningful insight from that this is the tidyverse collection so far um i have selected a number of them where if we are able to create expertise in them, then I believe that there is no sort of data that you cannot work with. So we have the tidy R, which is simply the package for reshaping and tidying data. We have the dplyr R for manipulating data. We have the table, which is to tidy data frames, to present data frames in a form that even by just looking at a data frame, you can actually see what the data frame is all about. We have a read R to reading data from different file formats. We also have the string R, which is used to work with strings and tests or characters. We have the forecast package to work with factors or categorical variables. We have the lubricate package, which is used to work with dates and time. So if we're a level of time series modeling, then lubricate is right for you. And then we have the pair, which is for functional programming and loops. So these are eight packages so far that has been exposed to you. There is one more that we have to mention, the ggplot2, the most powerful package so far in R for data visualization. And so we are hoping that we have enough time to be able to cover a lot of these packages so that we will gain the expertise we need to also move on to advanced levels where data manipulation isn't a problem. So we start off with the tidy R. So simply, we are going to learn what it means to reshape and tidy data. Now, I would like to introduce you to what a messy data is all about. This is data that I source from the World Development Indicators on time series variables for my country, Ghana. And if you look at the form of the data, it becomes very difficult for you to analyze this sort of data or produce any meaningful visualization from it head on. So you need to process data into this a form that makes it very easy for you to do any form of analysis you want to do with the data. So this is the messy data, and 
if we mention the concept of tidy data, the reason why this package was developed by the R core team, tidy data comes in two forms. We have the wide data and the long data. Now, if you take into consideration the wide data, this is the form of data we have been working with most of the time. So we have a column for each variable and a row for each observation. So from the messy data I showed you before, yes, we really are, huh? cleaned that data to make it appear tidy. And this is a tidy version of that. So I have sourced a number of variables from it. I have used some shorthand naming of variables like the FLI representing the financial liberalization index, REI representing the exchange rate. So all these variables now, each of these variables has its own column. And for that matter, this is what we mean by wide data. And then each row happens to be an observation for the variables in the columns. Now with long data, you are now going to have one column which indicates the type of variable contained in that row. And then you would have another column containing the values of each variable in the row. So if this is a Y data, I have taken time to create this sort of data, this um, imaginary data from uh, in, in Microsoft Excel and have just screenshot and placed it on the screen. So we have the first name, we have the last name, we have height and weight. So we see that each of these variables actually has its own column, all right? Now, if you reshape this data to a long format, this is going to appear. We are going to have the variables in one column, the type of variable, the first name, the last name, and the height and the weight, and its associated values in the rows. So you put all the variables together into one column, and then you accompany it with eight values on the right-hand side of it. This makes it very easy for you to sometimes put variables together and visualize all of them at once. So we will demonstrate that very shortly. So to reshape data in R, you can reshape the data from wide to long data format or from long data to wide data format. So if you want to reshape data from wide to long data format, then you have to use a function called the pivot longer. Now, earlier on, you know, the tidyverse collection is always being updated. That is why normally, typically, when we are using R, they would ask us to normally be updating some of the packages we've been using so far. So R is still under um, updates, okay? Now, earlier on, the function that was being used to convert data from wide to long data format was the gather function, right? But when the development of the gather function was complete, they translated it into the pivot longer. So if you know the pivot longer, then that would make it much easier for you to convert data from wide format to long format. Then if you also want to convert data from long to wide data, earlier on we're using the spread function in the tidy app. But now they've provided us with an easy syntax and it function called the pivot wider to allow us to convert our data from long data format to wide data format. So the pivot longer function takes in a number of arguments. It takes in the data, then it takes in the columns that you want to convert to the long data format or the, the columns that you want to put together under one column, right? And then we have the names to argument, which is to specify the name of the column of the type of variables that you've placed under one column. And then the values to is also used to name the values that will be associated with each type of variable in the column. So you can give them your, your own naming conventions or you can just use the default naming conventions by R. So typically, if you do not specify the arguments names to and values to, it defaults to naming the two columns name and value. If you want to convert your data from long format to wide data format, then you can also use the pivot wider function and the number of arguments so far you can pass in there to do what you require to do for you is to pass in the data frame first of all and then by default because the pivot longer actually uses the default naming name and value it also has a default naming parameter names from name values from value but if you had given them some 
the names you prefer to name your columns like for instance names two and then you happen to call it variables then it means that with the pivot wider if it is assuming you are converting from that sort of data to the wide format then the names from should be changed to variable right so we will demonstrate this in a short while now the data frame that we are going to use to demonstrate the reshaping of data is the air quality data set which happens to be in the base R. so we only need to upload this sort of uh, data into R, and which happens to be the new York air quality measurements that was taken um, from may to september in 1973. so at this point i would like us to go into R and demonstrate how to use the tidy R to reshape our data so first and foremost we would have to install the package primarily we are going to use the tidyverse so let me just call it package all right so if you do not have the tidyverse package installed then you would have to use the function installed dot packages and then pass in the name of the package in double quotes so i will just simply write tidyverse and then after you have installed the package you go ahead and load it in our memory to be able to access the functions in there and so you just go ahead and type the tidyverse into the library function i already have the package installed so i'll go straight to the point by running the code library tidyverse to load the package and you will notice that after it has finished loading into our memory you would see all the packages so far that are contained in the tidyverse collection so we have the ggplot2 the table the tidy out the reader and all those the packages that we mentioned earlier so now so now we need to load our data frame and we use the data function and then we pass in the data so we have the air quality and when you type the first three or four characters you would see a list of um, data sets in that category but then you have to select the one you want so you can finish typing it or you can click on the air quality so far showing on the screen to auto complete it for you now i would have to use the data function and pass in the name of the data frame to import into R. and you would see in the environment window that the data frame is displayed right there with 153 observations and six variables so it is typical for us to look at the first few observations of the data frame to know what sort of data we are working with so we use the head function and then we pass in the name of our data frame to view the first six observations and we've seen that we have ozone solar.r we have wind temperature month and day if you want to know what this data set is all about then you would have to consult the help feature in R by simply typing the question mark symbol and then the name of the data frame. So that after running that line of code, in the help tab on the bottom right hand corner of the screen, you would see the name, the description and the format of the data frame that you are working with. So you would notice that the ozone is a numeric data type uh, solar wind and temperature month and day they are all numeric data types okay at this point whenever you have a variable in its own column usually or typically is the case you are able to visualize the each variable separately like for instance if you take ozone ozone is numeric and it is continuous in nature our earlier session, um, we got to realize that if you have some the, the kind of category that a variable falls in, you will know what sort of uh, plot types to use to create the insights or the visualizations. So with ozone, it is continuous in nature. Solar is continuous in nature. Wind continuous. Temperature continuous. But month and day are discrete in nature. And so, for instance, if you wanted to visualize um, just ozone you might want to look at the distribution by running for instance a histogram or a density plot so we already have the gg plot in the tidyverse and i would just like to demonstrate a little bit uh, what we can do with that so i will just go ahead and type the gg plot function 
and it takes in our data frame as the first argument so data equals air quality and then we pass in the aesthetics to map them to the data frame so we will just simply say that in the aesthetics function x equals ozone and then we'll create a simple histogram to look at the distribution of that variable if there are missing values to remove them and give it that distribution so we can see this is positively skewed right if you wanted to visualize let's say the sum of the values of ozone uh, solar wind and then temperature in order to communicate to other people which of these environmental factors actually influence the environment more okay so we wanted to know whether temperature was the most influential or wind was the most influential if we wanted to do that then we need to find a way of putting all of them together like for instance if you wanted to create a bar chart uh, for all these variables ozone solar wind and temperature it becomes very difficult for you to do this when they are each in a separate column right so that would be very difficult this is why we would need to convert this white data to a long format where all these variables are put together under one column and then the associated values under a separate column and we can actually visualize the bar chart looking at the proportions of the the counts or the sum of all these values for uh, each of these variables so we would like to convert this data to a long format so let's just demonstrate how this can be done now when we later on move into the deep layout then i will introduce you to the pipe operator and i know indrek has done a very good job introducing you to that so i would assume we do not know anything about a pipe operator in the deep layout and because if you load the tidyverse package the pipe operator is there for you to access it and use it for your coding um for now i will hold on to that but it is technically a part of the deep layout package so when we get there then i will demonstrate how to use the pipe operator to chain functions to data right so as at this point any function that i use um, would have the data as the first argument i will specify it as such so let me just give a nice heading for that so convert the white data the air quality data frame to long data format you can also seek help from R in getting to know the various arguments that you can pass into the pivot longer function by placing the question mark before the function and I will give you the documentation on how to use the function so we see a lot of arguments that the pivot longer function can take but we normally want to work with the few of them that are necessary for us to do uh, what we really want R to do for us right so later on you can go ahead and look at the explanations to the arguments and see what the other arguments ought to also do so from the slides we actually got to pick up so let me just simply type the pivot longer function and we had the data so we are going to give it the data and then we'll give the columns with which we want to convert to long data format then the names to is by default name so let me just simply write it there and then the values to is also by default value so as you can see right there from the documentation names to name and then values to value so these are the four arguments that i want us to consider now we pass in the data frame so air quality right there and then we give it the columns that we want to convert to the white to the long format now if we do not specify any column argument then it is going to convert the entire data frame to long format so like for instance let me just simply comment this out and see what happens so if we run this entire line of code let's see what happens all right columns must select at least one column to make it work that's wonderful so let's debug it there are tidyverse select methods to specify the kind of columns that you want to use like for instance we have the everything function 
which selects everything from the data frame all the columns so assuming that i happen to type everything like this then i'm just trying to tell r to go into the air quality data frame and select all the columns and convert to the long data format so at this point if i run this line of code see what is going to happen so first of all let me just give you the head of air quality all right and then let us now run this line of code and see what's going to happen so by running that line of code what really happens we have a table data frame with the name because by default it has been named as name and then the values also has been named as value so we have the name and value and it puts all together the variable types under one column so we see ozone solar wind temperature month and day and then it repeats itself until it exhausts all the values in the data frame so like for instance if you look at the first observation of all the variables then ozone is going to take its first value which is 41 solar will take 190 wind 7.4 temperature 67 month 5 day 1 and it repeats itself again to the second observation so ozone will now take the second observation 36 118 8.0 and so on until it exhausts all the values thereabout but the whole point is that why would we want to have month and day comparable to ozone solar wind and temperature so we will need to select the first four columns ozone solar wind temperature and convert to the pivot longer so that visualization will be meaningful so now i would rather want to avoid using the everything right there so let me just copy the code and then paste it down here so for the columns argument then i am now going to pass a vector of the column names so i'll just go ahead and say ozone solar.r wind and then term for temperature like this so that these are the columns that i want to convert to the long data format so now if i run these lines of code then you would notice that the month and the day were excluded from being put under the column called name then we have the ozone solar wind temperature it repeats itself ozone solar wind temperature for all the values in the data frame right so what i want to do right now is to save this code in an object so let me just simply call it air quality long so i'm storing this data frame that we have created the long data format into the air quality long so let's rerun it now it is stored in there and you can now visualize using the ggplot and let's see how that's going to work so i'm going to pass in the data which is air quality long which contains a long data format then the aesthetics x is going to be mapped to the variable called name and then y will be mapped to the associated values so let me just call it value and then let us create a bar chart now remember that if you have one variable that is discrete and another that is continuous then you have to create a bar chart but you will have to use the geom call uh, the, that geometry layer geom call or you have to use the geom bar with a start set to identity so i'm using the geom call here to do that for us so if i run this line of code now we are able to put together all the types of variable and know which one influences the environment the most. So this is the reason why we would have to convert white data to long data format. Right, so that we can visualize multiple columns at a time and show their proportions and how they are influencing, uh, for in, in this case, how they are influencing the environment. So we see that solar radiation happens to influence the environment more than temperature, ozone, and wind. But if it were in wide data format, it would have been difficult for you to visualize all of them at once, unless you do so one after the other. Let's look at something right now. I want to copy these same codes down here 
and this time around perhaps be using without using the default conventional names assigned by R I may want to call it hmm, ENV factors maybe for environmental factors and then the values Let me just simply give them some name, all right? Just any ordinary name that can come to mind. So when you are doing your sort of data analysis and visualization, you will know what to name your columns. So I would like to name the column which has been set to the long format containing the types of variables that are specified in the columns argument in the pivot longer uh, function. I want to name it as environmental factors and then the subsequent one, let's call it all good I, I think let me just put it this way um, measures or measurements yeah that is very good so now if I run this line of code again and I take the first few observations so head let me just simply come into the R script head and I pass in the air quality long and run then we now have the column okay of the types of variables named to environmental factors and the associated values also given the name measurement so that in that case if i wanted to create a bar plot then i will have to set the x-axis to environmental factors and then the y to measurement And then visualize and we get the same thing but this time around the x-axis has been named according to the column name environmental factors and then the measurement and I think that makes it much more meaningful you can go ahead and use the other um, layers of ggplot to name your x-axis and then your y-axis but that is another thing for another time so I believe that you now see sense in why we would have to reshape data from wide format to the long format now when data is already in the long format we can also reshape it to the wide data format so like for instance we know that the air quality long is now in the long format ozone solar.r wind temperature and all those sort of things all these types of variables put under one column named as environmental factors and then the values are named as measurement so what should happen is if I want to convert this long data format to the wide format then I would have to use the pivot wider pivot wider function and if you want to know what arguments to pass into the pivot wider function we seek help from R by proceeding with the question mark and then we have these sort of arguments in there so we are going to grab the data then we grab the names from which by default is set to name considering the fact that the default naming convention in the pivot longer is name and value so by default names from is name and then values from is value but remember that the last code that I ran, we named our column as environmental factors and our values as measurements. So we need to specify these sort of uh, naming conventions before it can work. So let's pass in the data frame. So I'm just going to pass the air quality long data frame. And then the names from the name of the column is environmental factors. So I'll just simply come and replace that over here. So ENV factors. And then the values from, I also named it as measurement right there. So I just simply have to come and replace it right here as measurement. Now, if I run this line of code, I'm not saving it into anything else yet. So I just want to run it for you to see what's going to happen. So if I run it, are we back to our original data frame? Yes, we are. We have the month, we have day, ozone, solar, wind, temperature. Now, at the end of the day, you would notice that the ozone, solar, wind, and temperature have been placed after month and day. But in the original data frame, 
it is these columns before month and day but it doesn't matter they're actually the same so now i can simply store it into an object air quality white and run this so that if i go ahead and assuming i just wanted to view the first few observations the head of air quality white then we have our data frame back to the white data format so what will happen is it will take the types of variables under the column and then spread them to have its own separate columns in the white data format if we actually get this i would like to know if anybody has a question so far on the reshaping of data from long to wide wide to long and then we can proceed from there or if you have any concerns i don't want to put up here you can also say it in the chat and uh indrik is being the author to also assist you okay so let's go back to the slides and continue so again in the tidy r there are two more important functions we have the unite and separate we have a whole lot of functions in the tidy r package but i have selected four of them that are enough to do whatever you want to do with data when it comes to hiding data so we are just going to explore what these unite and separate functions also do the unite function is used to unite columns so for instance i think we are going to create our own data frame <clears throat> with columns for first name last name and maybe we can just append any more columns like height and weight and then with the first and the last name we can put it together by uniting these two columns into one and name it full name i think that would really make much more sense to you then assuming that we also have a data frame that contains some sort of character um, column and you wanted to separate that column into separate columns as well then you can use the separate function the unite function takes in the data argument takes in the call argument and then the ellipses the three dots right there so the data simply is the data frame that you're going to pass in the call is the new column name that you're going to give it because you are uniting two columns two or more columns and you want to give it one new column name so the call there is there to give you that new column name then the ellipses or the three dots there represents the columns that you want to unite then the sep actually means the separator to put between the two columns that you are uniting and it is an underscore by default you can give it a, a white space you can give it a hash symbol you can give it any symbol that you want to place in between those two columns that you are uniting now we also have the remove equals true by default which removes the input columns from the output data frame so if you give it the two columns that you want to unite then the diff the output data frame would not contain those inputs but if you set it to false then they will accompany the united column and then typically if you also have missing values in the data frame then of course you will need to specify any dot rm equals true so that the missing values will be removed prior to uniting each value otherwise for any row that has an na the resulting um, value in the in the united data frame will actually have the any right there if that is not a problem to you you can leave it there because it is false by default the separate function also takes in the data frame then it takes in the column name that you want to separate or split into into so the into also becomes another column uh, another argument that you can pass into the function so we have the into right there and they give it a character of new column names then the step there and if you can see the sort of uh, value that they've given the separator argument some square bracket with all the symbols all they're trying to say is i can take any alpha numeric symbol that you place in between a united column or a column that contains some kind of separator or whatever it is then the remove equals true also by default removes the input column from the output data frame so let's go ahead into r and practice it so at this point we are going to demonstrate how to unite columns so let me just simply give it a very nice heading unite columns and before we do that i want us to create our own very um short data frame and so i would just simply want to name it as df and we know df is the user convention for naming data frames and then we use the data.frame function and we go ahead and specify the 
variables that we want to have in there and the associated values in there. So <clears throat> let's have something like first name. And then I have <clears throat> my first name, Elijah. We have, I don't know whether Indrik, that is your first name, but I'm just using it okay. Then Ishvin. So let's use three, that is okay. Then the last name. Actually, let me change this one to equal sign. Uh, that is why they use two assignment operators in R. The less than hyphen symbols put together, and we have the equal sign, the single equal sign. Now, let me use the, the less than hyphen all throughout and see what's going to happen and, and why we would have to use the equal sign um, in the data frame function. So, let me continue on. So, a vector of last names appear, Indrik. And then we have each being your last name is A U R, right? Yeah. And then let's give them some values like height. So let's say I am 170 centimeters. Um, in Drake, let's assume that is 160. Then each being 180. Don't mind me, okay? I'm just giving you some default values. All right. And then the weight. So I weigh 90 kilograms. Indrik, you weigh 45 kilograms, forgive me, it's been 20 kilograms. Let's call our data frame and you see what really happens. Huh. I really can't decipher what this data frame is. Okay? And the very reason is because we'd have to change this assignment operator to the equal sign when we are doing so. Okay? Because if you use the equal sign here, that would really work fine. But if you're using the less than hyphen, then change whatever is in there, assuming it is using an assignment operator, use the other assignment operator. So let's change this one to the equal signs. Like that. And so if you run it and then call out our data frame, we have a very nice data frame. First name, last name, height and weight. So with a unite function, we'd want to unite the first name and last name into full name. So first of all, We specify the data argument. Then we specify, is it a column? Exactly. So the call happens to be the new name that we want to give the united column. I think that is all for now, right? There are more. So if I want to know what sort of argument can be passed in there, we seek help from R. So help, unite, and I'm there. Then the ellipsis, okay, so one, two, three, comma. And then what else? We have the remove, which is true by default. And then we have the na.rm, which is also false by default. And these are the arguments that so far we'll need for it. Now, since there are no NAs, let's shorten the code by removing the NA.RM. Now, let's pass our data frame. So, DF, so we named it. Then the name of the new column, let's call it full name. And then the ellipses, we replace it with the columns that we want to unite them. And so we have a vector of <clears throat> first name and then last name. Now, not forgetting the fact that there is a separate argument, which is underscore by default. So let me just put it right there. So that if I run these lines of code all together, let's see what happens after uniting them. Now, what do we see? We have the full name. So it has named our united columns. And then we have the first and last names joined together, but separated by the underscore. 
now let me copy the same lines of code this time around let us change the underscore to the hash symbol so if you run this code too you find that the names that are put together are separated by the hash symbol as well in the output data frame but i think it would make much more meaningful if we rather put a white space rather than any other symbol so i just place a space in between the two quotes for the separate argument run and then i think this is wonderful now you will notice that when the remove argument is set to true it removes the input columns the first name and the last name from the resulting data frame so if i copy these codes yet again and change the remove equals true to false and run it then you can see that the first name and last name remain in the output data frame along with the united column so you need to decide on which one that you want to use so assuming this is what we really needed then we can go ahead and save it let's call it df united and then call out the df united and then we have this data frame if this is what we really wanted now we can go ahead and also demonstrate how to separate the columns so we'll create our own data frame yet again this time around let me go and copy the data frame that we created and do a slight modification to that and at this point i would like to put forward the full names And let's just call it Pune, like this. So I run both, and then we have full name, height, and weight. So we want to split or separate the full name column to first name and last name. So all we have to do is to use the separate function and now we need to figure out what sort of arguments that we can pass in there so it takes in the data the column that we want to separate the into argument that is the names of the new columns and then the separate argument right there so let's go ahead data the column that we want to separate into a separator and it also has the remove element which is also let's find out and see so question mark and let's seek help from R remove is also true by default and I think these arguments are just okay so now with our data frame we pass in the df the column is the full name and then we are separating this full name column into then we pass in a character of the vectors representing the names of the new column so we have first name and then last name then what separator lies between the united column it is a white space so we simply go ahead and specify a double code and put a space in between them and if that happens and we run these lines of code now we have the first name last name height and weight but because the remove equals true argument is right in the separate function you notice that it removes the input column which is the full name from the output data frame
So if we change the true value to false and run it yet again, <clears throat> then we have the full name also accompanying the output data frame. So assuming this is what we really wanted, then I can go ahead and save it. So let's call it df separate. Run it, and then we can call out the df separate separately, and then we have our full name, the first name, last name, height, and weight. Now let's go back to the slides, and then we continue right from there. Now dplyr. So dplyr is primarily the grammar of data manipulation. And it contains functional verbs for practicing the data manipulation. And so the common dply R verbs, there are so many of them, but the common ones we normally use to fulfill what we really need to do when it comes to data manipulation are these ones. So we have the select verb, which is a function, which is used to select the columns from the data frame, filter, which is used to filter data based on conditions. We have the mutate, which is to add new variables or transform variables. Now the mutate has its sibling known as transmute, and I will demonstrate the difference between the two. We have the rename for renaming columns. We have arrange for arranging data in ascending or descending order. And then we have the summarize, which is usually used with the group by function or the group by verb <clears throat> to summarize data. Now we talk about the pipe operator. So the pipe operator in dply r is the percentage symbol greater than symbol and the percentage symbol put together. <clears throat> and this is used to link functions to data primarily. So for instance, if you wanted to run a summary of the MT cast data frame, now the MT cast data frame is an inbuilt data frame which is in the base package so you don't need to install any package to have access to that so you wanted to generate a summary of this data frame you say summary function and you pass in the name of the data frame but with a pipe operator you can take out the data empty cast out and link the function to that data with a pipe operator just like it's seen on the screen sometimes you can limit your data to a vector of the column that you want to actually um, generate the statistical analysis. Like for instance, you want to find the mean of the MPG variable in the MT cast data frame. So in order to access that variable, MPG, you would have to go into the MT cast data frame, followed by a dollar symbol that allows you to access the column from that data frame, so MPG. And typically, you might want to say mean of MPG variable and if there are any values, you would want to specify the argument any.rm equals true, which is part of the mean function. So you can also take the data right out, like empty cast mpg outside, and then you now chain your mean function to the data with the pipe operator, and then you can go ahead and specify any further argument that happens to be in the function, like the na.rm equals true. That will make it very easy. So you can practice it at the end, and you see that they work all fine and the same. So when it comes to using the select verb in dply arrow, the first argument is the data frame. But you can also take the data frame out there and then you link the select function to the data and you pass in any other thing that the select function is prepared to do. So the ellipsis after the data argument is the columns that you want to select from the data frame. So you can just go ahead and take the data out type select and then you put in the columns that you want to you want to select that makes it very easy and the reason why the pipe operator was also created in the deep layer is that when it comes to data manipulation you might want to not just select columns you might want to select you might want to filter you might want to mutate all at the same time you can link them with the pipe operator and it does so for you wonderfully The filter function also follows the same convention. It takes in the data frame as the first argument. You can bring it out and then change the filter function and pass in the, the conditions on which you want to filter. Mutate, rename, group by, 
Now we are going to use the wage one data frame in which is which happens to be in the Woodred package, right? So we have to install the Woodred package. And now in our previous lesson, we had that installed and we we're able to import that data frame, right? So um, it is a, it is the data from the 1976 current population survey, which was collected by Harry Faber, who was once in MIT. And if you want to know the description of this data frame, of course, you can seek help from her. So let's practice. So at this point, we are now on to the D ply R. And so we have select, which takes in the data and all of these. Now we have filter data. We have mutate. We have a range we have group by and then we also have the summarize but usually the summarize like I said is used with the group by make much more sense Now, I would like to bring in the transmute there. And we'll demonstrate the difference between the two, transmute and mutate. They are siblings, actually. So before we start using these verbs, now we'd have to install the world rage package. And afterwards, load it in ours memory to access the weight one data frame. So once that is done, so I'm running the library to load the Woodridge package into my memory. At the end of the day, I already have it installed. So now I'll use the data function and pass in the weight one data frame and call it into R. Right, and we can see in the environment window, the weight one data frame is right there with 526 observations and 24 variables. Now, this data frame is very raw in nature and there are some kind of data manipulation we have to do. So that is why I chose this data frame. So we start with selecting columns. So we need to look at the first few observations of the weight one data frame. And then we have wage, education, experience, tenor, non-white, female, married, number of dependents. So if you want to know the description of these variables, then all you have to do is to run question mark, wage one, seek help from R, and then you have the labels to the variables so that the wage we know is the average hourly earnings the EDUC is the years of education and so on now there are some variables that would have to rename their columns later on such as for instance female it says equals one if the person is a female that means it has values zero and one so zero represents the male now Later on, I would like to give the labels, the value labels themselves. Like if it is one, it should be replaced with female. If it is zero, it should be replaced with male. Now, when that happens, you believe that the female label of the one in that column will conflict with the name of the column. So I would change the name of that column from female to gender. That makes much, much more sense. Then when it comes to the married column as well, I would set the one equal to married, the zero equals to single, so that I would change the name of the column to marital status. 
and we'll see if there is any other kind of data manipulation that we can do like for instance the smsa that is the name of the column but it will pay for us to change it to maybe region where if it is equal to one you live in smsa otherwise you live in a rural area smsa is an urban area i know somewhere in the united states right so um we can make it smsa and then zero for rural or maybe not in smsa or something so there are one of these few things that we can do when it comes to deep learning and that will make it very easy for us to be working with data frames when it comes to data manipulations so what do we have to do right now remember that we said we are using the pipe operator so just like up here we use the head function and then we pass in the name of the data frame you know that I can take out the data frame and then chain it to the head function this way. And it does the same thing by giving you the first six observations of the data frame. So I take the data out and I link the function to using the pipe operator. So this is what I want to do. I'm going to grab the wage one data frame and then pipe the select function to the data and then specify the columns that I want to select so let us assume that I wanted to select wage education experience tenor so we have wage education experience tenor then I would jump straight to for instance L wage which is the logarithmic wage experience squared and tenor squared now if you want to do that you would have to type first of all first of all you would have to type the names of the columns later on i'll show you how you can do it easily so with some of these um, tidyverse selection uh, uh, methods so let's assume i'm doing it the manual way as if i really do not know anything except the select function i'll just go ahead and pass in wage education experience tenor and then jump straight to l wage experience squared and then the tenor squared so that once this is done now let me break this a little bit because it's going beyond our the limits of the window so let's break it down and i'm going to pipe the head function to that so that after it has selected these variables or these columns then we only display the first six observations of the data frame so by running this we can see the variables that we specified are selected and are shown for us with the first six observations of that data frame now let us look at the head of the entire data frame again and then you will notice that the wage up to tenor are kind of it follows right so wage education experience tenor so once it follows you can adopt a shorthand for some of these tidy selection methods by saying wage to tenor comma then if we come down here l wage to tenor squared i can also make it l wage to tenor square like this now let us change the first few observations to see whether they are the same so let me run this first and run this again and if they are the same then this would look very much shorter simpler and easy to to do But how did I get to know that by placing the colon symbol in between these two variables, it will select from the first column I specified to the, that last column I specified. So if you want to know in details how I did that, all you have to do is to seek help by writing the question mark followed by the select function, and then R will help you to do this. So let's find out. It says that tidyverse selections implement a dialect of R 
where operators make it easy to select variables. So for instance, if you specify the colon symbol, then it is used for selecting a range of consecutive variables. Now at the same time, if you also use the exclamation mark, it is used for taking the complement of a set of variables. And we know that that exclamation mark usually in programming languages means not. So for instance, for all these columns I selected, I can only do what? For instance, let's say I'm selecting wage, education, experience, turn up to the tenor squared. So what I have to do is to, for instance, let me place the exclamation mark before the wage and let's see what really happens. Without the exclamation mark, if I should run these lines of code, we know that this is a sort of data frame that actually uh, comes about. But if I put the exclamation mark before the wage, Let's rerun it and see what happens. <clears throat> so you will notice that we have only the wage not appearing in the data frame, but all other columns happen to accompany the selection, right? All other columns. Now, what really happens is after it read the very first instance, Okay, and excluded it because that one is for taking the complement. That means just exclude the one for which the exclamation mark precedes it and bring me the rest of the columns. So R became so stubborn to even ignore the fact that aside taking out which you would have to bring me only these columns. So that means when you're also using some of these tidy best selections, you should know exactly what you want to do. So maybe if I wanted to exclude all of these variables, then I would have to place all of them in round bracket so that this exclamation mark applies to all. Let's see what is going to happen if we do that. Hmm. Unexpected comma. All right, so it read this nicely. Now we open the parenthesis, wonderful, and then the wage. So it encountered this comma and it gave us an error. So maybe we should have wrapped them in the C function as a vector to make it work. So now I have placed the C function right there. Let's run it again and see. Do we have our data frame? Yes, we do have. So it will return all the columns except the ones that I have placed in the vector in the select function. So there's no way, there's no education, there's no experience, there's no tenor. So these are some of the ways that you can be working with the deep parallel verbs. If there's something that you are not comfortable with or not sure about, just go ahead and see the documentation from R. Now we have the ampersand symbol and then the, the straight pipe. Okay, this is also called pipe, but it's a straight pipe or the vertical pipe and it is used for selecting the intersection so the ampersand is used for selecting the intersection and the pipe is used for selecting the union of two set of variables but i'm pretty sure that by using the ampersand symbol you might not get what you want because at the end of the day you must have value in the in the two columns that you specify corresponding values or something like that to display so the only way you can do this is, for instance, if I happen to take a female and married, let's find out what's going to happen. So if I say wage one, then I pipe the select and I go ahead and say a female variable and married. And let's view only the first six observations. Hmm. It cannot take the intersection of two columns. So female and married is always an empty selection because it doesn't really find matches. It's going to be something like select the column for me where female and married are equal, something like that. Okay. So that really usually don't work all the time. And if you wanted to actually come out with a column that contains maybe matches, then you would have to consider the joins in the deep layer. So we have the left join, the right join, the full join, the inner join, and those sort of joins. 
So how about if I had used the or operator for selecting the union of the two set of variables? How about I do that? If I put it there, then it brings the two columns, female and the married. Because all you are trying to say is that retain the female or married, it retains both for you. So remember that when I was placing before these selections, the exclamation mark, I had to combine the selections into the C function. And so that is why this tidy selection is all right there. And then we have the everything. Remember, I demonstrated that in the tidy app, which selects everything. So if you wanted to bring out all the columns, you just go ahead and write something like wage one and then select and then you just simply pass in everything like this and it's just like calling the the the, the entire data frame which one select everything when i did that i have to call the first few observations else it will bombard us with a lot of uh, a, a lot of oh, the entire data frame so the first few observations are fine so you can see all the variables have been brought out Now, you can also go ahead and demonstrate the last call, which is to select the last variable in the data frame. And the last variable is Turner square. So if you go ahead and say, select, and then pass in the last call, like that, and run, then we have the Turner square. Okay, so that is why I usually want to display the first few observations, like that, and we can see the last column brought about. So these are helpers that actually would help you to select variables that are matching uh, what patterns in their name. So for instance, if you wanted to call out a column that starts with A, then you can just use the start with in the select function and pass in a character A. And to do that for you. So I only demonstrated once for the start with and the rest of them, I believe you will be able to handle it all fine. So for instance, I'm going to bring out variables that end with the characters SQ. So let's use the ends with, so I'm going to say wage one, select, ends with, then in double code SQ. So that if I display the first few observations, you, you will know what variables come out, the experience squared and the tenor squared. Or I could have used the contains so after this one I will leave the rest for you to experiment contains SQ and that will also bring you the experience squared and the tenor squared so now we can move on to filter data Now here we can <clears throat> filter data based on conditions. Like what? Like why don't we retain the entire data frame? Okay, first of all, because we have used the select verb, I would want us to use the select with a filter. So I'm going to grab the data frame and I'm going to select wage up to tenor. And then I am going to filter that data frame for where <clears throat> female equals one. And then only display the first six observations. Object female not found. So what happened? All right. So names of wage one. And let me see the column names. We do have female, right? So the issue is coming from the fact that we only selected wage up to tenor and there was no female in that. So we will encounter that sort of problem. So if we had included 
a female then would happen to have our data frame where female equals one so this means whenever you are using the dply r verbs in the order which which you use them you should know what sort of selection or filtering or mutation that you are doing so it helps you in the data manipulation so you selected wage up to tenor and then you accompanied it with female so this would be the data frame that is existing as at the time you are chaining the, the select function to the data frame so now you can filter this resulting data frame for where female equals one Now let's do that for the entire data frame so wage one and then we're just going to say filter the entire data frame for where female equals one and let's only display the first few observations and it works out fine and if you see the female column where is it then you would notice one 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 values under it because it has excluded or removed where female equals zero all those sort of data away those observations now you can also specify multiple conditions so like for instance you can say which one now let us filter a data frame where female equals one and married equals one so we need married females in the data frame and let us call out the first few observations oops Sorry, I'm using the single equal sign and I'm supposed to use the double equal sign for that relations. Thank you. So at the end of the day, if you run it, now we have our data frame for where female equals one and married equals one. So this entire data frame that happens to be for observations where there are married females. So if you wanted to do any visualization, then you can go ahead and do it for married females. So maybe you can look at wage against experience, a scatter plot like weight against experience for married females. So you see how vital data manipulation is and how, how, how easy it is to work with the tidyverse. Now I can specify the same lines of code, but this time around without using the ampersand symbol to denote the intersection or yeah, or the and kind of meaning behind it then i can only separate them with a comma so if you separate the two conditions with a comma r is able to read it as and so it says female equals one and married equals one and if you run it you get the same thing so how do you know i'm not deceiving you in this regards why don't we save the first one into for instance x and then the second one into say y so if i run the two then i can go ahead and there is a function in r call identical and i pass in the x and y and it returns true if the data frame is identical and if it is false it means those two data frames are not identical so which means using the and operator or separating with a comma that's the same thing So by running the identical between x and y, get true. So now let me join one more, select and filter. So what I'm going to say is, let's grab the wage one data frame and select wage education experience, the experience squared, and then the tenor squared and female and married because they have to accompany the selection the tenor squared there is no e there good and then filter this entire data frame for where female equals one and so and i can use the comma and then married also equals one let's view the first few observations of the data frame ouch the married equals one the double equal sign 
and it is normal for every programmer, right? So we have our nice data frame right here. Now notice that I am running the raw codes without assigning it into any other object. So if you wanted to retain this data frame and use it for visualization or further analysis, then you have to save it into a data frame. So maybe I could call it wage one female married, just to make sense of the name and run so that that data frame is stored in that object. So if I wanted to visualize, I can say ggplot and I pass in our data to be equal to the wage one female married. And then the aesthetics, I would say wage. And then the y, I will set it to experience. And I will create a scatter plot because wage and experience are continuous data. So a scatter plot. And so this would be the relationship between wage and experience for married females. Then you make sense of the visualization that you've created. So once you have created this, you can go ahead and give it any sort of um, um, aesthetics that can make it look much nicer. Like for instance, maybe increasing the size of the points and giving the X and Y labels and a title for the graph and all those sort of things and giving it a theme or anything. There's one more thing in filter that we have not done. That is by specifying an all condition and we use the vertical pipe. So for instance, you can go ahead and say something like, so let me come down here and grab wage one. And let us filter our data frame for where the entire data frame for where married equals one or female equals zero or you can specify a lot of conditions depending on whether you actually know the sense in doing that so married equals one female equals one and what other variable is in there for me to use maybe the west equals one so west equals one i know all these are going to be present so at the end of the day let me view the first few observations of that and yes so where the west equals one now when you use the all operator it most likely brings <laughs> virtually the entire data frame or something because the all operator as long as it is satisfied to be true the whole thing becomes true So you notice that even for where female equals zero, we have the ones in there because you specified an all operator. But if you specify an and operator, then strictly it goes by married equals one, female equals one, west equals one. And removes all the zeros. Uh, where the observations where zeros are there for these uh, variables for which you are filtering your data frame. Now we can look at mutating columns. This is where you can add new variables to the data frame or you can transform the variables. So like for instance, there is experience and experience squared, tenor and tenor squared, but there is no education squared. So why don't I create another variable called education squared. So I'm going to grab the data frame and then let us pipe the mutate verb. Now with the mutate verb, you set the new column followed by the transformation. So the new column is going to be education squared. So I'm, I'm naming it so. E D U C S Q, and then it is going to be the square of education.
Now, if I view the first few observations, let's find out whether a new variable has been added known as education squared. So if I run this, I do have the education squared right there. So you can create multiple variables in addition. So maybe what else can we do? Like weight squared, education squared. Then you can grab this code or let me grab this code and then go ahead and say wage s skill equals wage squared. And then we have these two columns added up. Now, I mentioned that the mutate verb has a sibling known as transmute. And so I want to grab these lines of code and only change the mutate to transmute. And notice the difference. So right now, when we use the mutate to create the square of education and wage, they were included in there, and there is the wage and education variables in there as well. But if we run the transmute instead, then what happens? It drops all columns and brings you the transformation that you did. So whenever I use the transmute, that is why it is normally not mentioned as part of the common dply R verbs. But it kind of drops all the variables and leave you the transformation. So the mutate is just okay. So let me just add some comments right here. So it removes all columns except the transformation, or let me say except the new variables in there. So if you want to use the transmute, you trade with caution. So this was only just in passing. So let's kind of separate it a little bit. So that you will know this is a misfit. Now we move on to arranging data in ascending order, ascending or descending order. So we use the arrange. Okay. So with one data frame, and then we arrange. Now the arrange will take the column for which you want to arrange the entire data frame in ascending or descending order. So let's put in the variable that we want to arrange in a send or descend order. Then afterwards, we will only display the first few observations. So if I pass in wage one, now let's say I am printing the entire data frame without the first few observations. So if I go to the wage column, where is it? You will notice that it starts off with 3.1, 3.2, 3.0, 6.5. 8 hmm is it increasing sorry i passed in the wage one that is the entire data frame i passed into the arrange function sorry so i had to pass in the wage exactly because <laughs> i didn't really get what was really happening here so now let me clear the console and then rerun the code and then now we can see it sorted in ascending order right like that so the first few observations then you would know that wage has been sorted in ascending order with 0 0.53 being the smallest value in there and increasing thereof so if you wanted to arrange it in descending order then you would have to wrap 
the variable inside of the DESC function in the arrange function. Like that. So DESC function, and then you pass in the wage column for which you want to arrange in descending order inside of the arrange function. And then let's display the first few observations. And then we have the highest value in there from 24.98 decreasing thereof. So this one is ascending order by default. And now it is descending order. So let's grab the wage one. Let us select wage education and experience. Let us filter for where wage is greater than hmm, is greater than fifteen, and experience is greater than twenty. Then afterwards, let us arrange okay hold on let us mutate because we use the mutate verb so i want to use all the verbs that we've used so far so let us mutate because in the select function where we are selecting wage education and experience we have an experience squared in the data frame but it will not accompany this data frame that we are creating right here so i want to mutate and create my own experience squared which is the experience the part two and then afterwards, I would want to arrange my wage in ascending order. If I run this, then we have 11 observations. We narrowed it down for where our wage values are greater than 15, experience greater than 20, then we've created and experience quite a new variable which is the square of experience and included in this data frame and then the wage variable or the wage column is sorted in ascending order not only can you sort only one column in ascending order but you can sort them two or three or four variables and you have to put all of them in that range verb so maybe you can sort the wage in ascending order and also let me grab the entire lines of code So, okay, so whilst I sort the range, uh, the, the, the wage in ascending order, then I'm going to also sort the education in descending order. So, D, E, S, C, and I pass in education. If I run this, then let us find out. So, we have, we arrange the wage in ascending order, and then the education in descending. But let's look at something. We have the 16, we have 17. Ascending, then it descends to 14, 12, and 18. And the reason is that we have arranged the wage by ascending order, and it must conform to that principle before it does the descending order for education. Right? But if we had removed the wage, there would no right head on that education would have been sorted in descending order. So it also means that whenever you are using some of these combinations of ascending, descending, or Two more, more variables to sort you should know um, that the first one would directly conform to their ascending if it's ascending and the rest of them will follow in that order so it may not necessarily mean that once you have sorted the weight in ascending order and the education in descending order the education must strictly be in descending order because it must make sure that the weight is in ascending order Now, grouping and summarizing data. 
Now in this data frame, um, okay, before grouping and summarizing data, uh, why don't we look at uh, renaming columns? Renaming is there. Renaming columns. So that is what we are going to do. From the variables, let us do that for female and married. Now, I would want us to change the female label to gender. So let me describe the steps so that when we are doing that, it becomes very easy for us. So the first step is rename female to gender. The second step, married to marital status. So once I'm able to do the first two or three, I believe that you can do the rest if you have this sort of data frame. So maybe, what else? We have the South, we have West. Hmm. We have services. One is in the services, industry, service. What else can I do right here? If I'm using the South, and I specify region. Remember that there is also another column called West, which is also part of region. So if I use region for South, I might still conflate myself with the West. So I think I better maintain it right here for now. So maybe the SMSA, that would be really good. I could call it area. That is where you live. Oh, okay, location. That is really nice. So let us change the SMSA to, we will re rename it to location so this is how we do it we grab the data frame then we rename okay let me narrow it down now that we know the other verbs so let us select female married smsa then maybe let's accompany it with something that at least Will, will make the data frame a little bit holistic. So wage and experience, that's all. And then we will go ahead and rename. Okay, that means we are only selecting these variables from the data frame and then renaming the columns, female, married, and SMSA. But that will not be in the original data frame. But I think it would be more appropriate for me to do that in the original data frame because i really want the female to be rendered as gender so that later on i can recode the values from one to female zero to male because if i recode one to female zero to male the name of the column is female and it doesn't really make sense with having female as a column name and then female male as values so i will change it to gender and then i can have female male right in there so let's maintain it and set upon the rename verb. Now the rename will take the new column name equals the old column name. So the new column name, let's grab gender and that replaces female. Then marital status and that replaces married. And then location replaces SMSA. Now, if I do this and check the first few observations of the data frame, then <clears throat> in there we have gender, marital status, and then location replacing the old column names. Sometimes, if you believe that writing a code makes it look so much longer, you can just break them apart this way. Uh, I have a question. Right. That since you made changes in wages one, wage one data set, which is already in R, so uh, so next time if you open R, like after you close, like next day, 
so are these changes permanent like now it is permanently a marital status has changed to married or the next day you'll open it would uh, the the data set would uh, like be into its original form all right so anything that you are doing currently any changes you are making is temporary so okay when you close R and then you open it back again, you call in the which one data frame, it will default to its original uh, data frame. So if you want to retain your changes, so that maybe further on, you would want to work with that changed data frame, then you have to store it into another object and export it to CSV or Excel file or any other file format and save it locally on a computer so that you can import that data frame and then you have your changes still there. Yeah, but anytime you in, uh, call in the data frame wage one from the Woodridge package, it will remain its own original piece. Uh, what if we are working on our own data set and we are making changes here, like we are renaming it here, like it's our own original file, like we have loaded with write.csv, right, from our, it's our Excel file and we are making changes there. So will that be retained or that will also be not retained? Yeah, that will also not be retained anytime you call it in again. So it would mean that, assuming you had a CSV file locally on a computer that has been named as, let's call it DF, for instance, and you bring it into R, you make your changes, then you would have to save a change data frame to the same name DF and it will replace the original file on locally on a computer. Yeah, but if you do not save it in that name and save it another thing else, the same DF on your computer will retain its originality. Okay, so now that I have renamed the female to gender, uh, married to marital status, and SMSA to location, I would want to replace it into the original data frame that I have imported. So now let me remove the head. This one was just to check the first few observations. So let me copy it right down and take away the head function chained. And then I'm going to save it into wage one. Now, this means that the original data frame from the Woodridge, Woodridge package that has been now brought locally onto my R workspace, it is going to have these columns replaced with their new column names right now. But if I do not save it, close it, come back the next time, import the Woodridge package and then calling the wage one data frame. I'm not going to have these changes seen. So what I would do is, even if I've saved it as wage one, then I will write it to a CSV file and save it locally on my computer. So that next time, if I want to work with this data frame, I will have to import the one on my computer to R and I have my changes made. But if I go ahead and load the Woodridge package again and call in that wage one data frame, it will still default to its original data frame. So right now I'm saving it into wage one so that if I run this line of code and then I check the head of the data frame, then I would notice that the gender marital status and the location has been affected. So once that is there, now you know how to rename column. So you only bring out the rename verb you specify the new column name equals the old column name. Now, let me go to the heading and make it renaming columns and recoding values. And the reason is that there is a recode verb in dplyr which will also help you to recode or assign value labels to values in your column like for instance we know that gender now has one for female zero for male but if you give this data frame to somebody else that person may find it really difficult in knowing whether one truly is male or female or zero is male or female except that if you give this sort of um, description to that person but that person sees female in the description and not gender so if you're giving this description then you have to change it accordingly in the description to that person 
but I want to save the trouble of doing all of that. So what I want to do is let me recode the value of one to female and zero to male. So if I send it to anybody else, the person knows that there is female and male and no one and zero values in there. So what I'm going to do is now at this point, um, it's very technical in the sense that if you take the recode function, it's recode part of the tidyverse. Let's find out. I know there is a recode function, but maybe exactly. So it's part of the tidyverse. But then if we check the use, it takes in a dot x initial argument and it is a vector to modify. It is not a data frame. So the recode verb in the dply app does not take data. That means the entire data frame as its, um, as its first argument, right? It takes in a vector. So that, mean, that means you have to narrow it down to a specific column that you want to recode. So it means that I would have to say recode wage one and select gender itself separately. Then I will now need to start giving the recoding values. Now, to help you with the syntax for using the recode function, it is going to be something like recode. So you pass in your variable. So the argument is dot x. Let's make it very simple. Let's say variable var. So for the variable, so you narrow it down. Then you will take the value you want to record and then the label you want to give it. So I'm just trying to create my own set of arguments. So not technically in the record function, but just to make it much more readable to you. So you have to place the value in backticks like that. Let me zoom in a little bit. So we have the back text wrapped around the value and then you give it your label and your label too must be a character. So let me comment this out. And then we have wage one and the gender variable. So I'm going to say we have male and female but it has values one and zero so the one must be equal to female and then zero equals male but the value must be wrapped in the back text and the zero in the back text as well otherwise it will not work if I ignore the backticks and just run this, we get unexpected in record. Hmm. But if we put the backticks around them and run, wonderful. We see the labels being applied, female, male, female, male. Last time in our previous session, we were using if else function. But this time around, I want us to stick to the tidyverse. So typically, this is what people normally do, programmers. Now, once I have done this, you have seen that the values have been replaced with the labels, male and female, but you have to save it into the original variable. So what we do is wage one and then select the gender this way and store it right in there. But before I execute the code to store this, in order to write the code to make it look so nice, what I'm going to do is I grab the wage, the wage one, gender. Then I am going to save. Now I grab the wage one, gender again, and I'm going to chain the record function to the vector. So record so that the record function is going to take because I told you that if you have any sort of data in your dply algorithm, you can bring it out and chain the function to that. So I have taken the wage one gender out and now I'm going to change the record. So the record now is going to take these values that I have assigned here. So I'm going to say the back takes I put in the one equals female, comma, let me come down here. The back takes zero 
equals mu. Like that. So that now if I run the entire lines of code and then I check the first few observations. So which one? Head. Then let's go find out whether the values have been replaced right in there. Do we have it? Yes. Gender. We have the female, female, male, male, and the labels have been applied. So this is how you record. So you can put it together. So view, zoom out. You can put it together like this. Or you can split them following the dply r syntax we've been learning by chaining the pipe operator, the function through the pipe operator to the data itself. And having labeled them, you can go ahead and store into the vector itself in the data frame and it will be affected so. I have a question like can we use the name like if we use the name will it also replace one by female or not? Could we use come again? Uh, can we use the name like the one the one which we used earlier to change the gender to female so here we cannot use rename to change one to female and zero to male. Yeah in fact the rename verb it's used to only rename the columns. Okay. Yes. And recode for the for the values. Exactly. Uh, and here you should wrote one like old one with the new one. And in case of rename, we have to use new one is equals to old one. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So that is exactly so. With the rename, the new column name equals the old one, but with the recode, the old value equals the new value right and the difference is that the rename the renames columns and the recode recodes the value labels great okay so let us go ahead and recode the marital status where one equals married and zero equals single so we just go ahead and say wage one then we grab the marital status we are going to assign it in there then we grab the wage one and then the marital status and then we chain the recode function to it and then let's break the parentheses and start with zero equals for instance single and then one equals married so once that is done if I take the head of the data frame again, then we can see that our marital status is single, married, single, married, married. And then the location, once again, one to SMSA and zero to not SMSA. So again, wage one, location, and then wage one, location, and then we chain the recode function. And then if it is one, the one in backticks, then we assign the label SMSA. Come on. And then if it is zero, we assign it not SMSA. And if I run this unexpected, oh, sorry. So the comma is supposed to be outside of the double quote in the SMSC. So if I run it again and now check the head of the data frame, then we can see that we have the SMSC, not SMSC values, value labels assigned in the location column. So once I have done this, you can go ahead and if you want to visualize, you can do so. So if you want to group and summarize data, so for instance, uh, you can just simply use the group by function. So let's chain our data. So with one data frame and then followed by the group by and then we pass in the variable for which we want to group the entire data frame. So let's say we want to group by gender. So male, female. Now, if you run this line of code, the only thing that happens is the entire data frame gets printed out. But this time around, if you look at the label on top of the data frame, you see that the groups is by gender, all right? And so once the groups are by gender, then 
um, it tells you that there are two value labels for the gender, male and female. So it has grouped them by males and grouped them by female. But really, you cannot see anything that makes it look like it is grouped, except the label at the top, right? So sometimes to make it much more meaningful, we use the group by with a summarize function. Okay, so once it has been grouped, let me break this one down. Then, for instance, I can summarize by saying that AVG of wage, so average wage, equals the mean of wage. So that if I run this line of code now, by groups, I'm able to see that female, the average wage for females is $4.59, and the average wage for males is also $7.10. So you could just simply use the grouping without the summarize or you can also use the summarize without the, the grouping but then you would have to know what form it takes. So we have the wage one group by gender. You notice that it retains the data frame and there is a label on top making you aware that it has been grouped by gender. So the various groups that you specified as gender. And then you can also take the data frame and summarize, so for instance, the mean of the wage column in the data frame and give it the name average wage. So if you run this one too as well, you will get only the average wage, just that you should know that the 5.89 represents the average wage that everybody else uh, actually receives in the United States. So we combine the two of them to make much more meaningful uh, summaries so group by the gender and then to summarize where the average wage equals the mean of wage and then now you have your gender and you have your average wage and you will notice that we have the average wages for for each group So further down, you can also group by more than one variable. So for instance, wage, and then we group by, say, gender. And remember, we also have marital status. So we are grouping by marital status as well. And then we want to summarize now the summarize verb, you can use the S or you can use the Z. They did it for both and um, you can do so. So um, let's say the average wage for these two groups is the mean of wage. And let's see how that appears if you are grouping by two of them. So when that happens, it takes a female for married, female single, and the corresponding average wages that they receive. So 4.57 US dollars on average for married females and 4.61 US dollars for single females in the, in the United States. And then 7.98 on average, um, 7.98 dollars on average for married males and then 5.17 dollars on average for uh, single males. Right. So at the end of the day, why don't we give a very holistic visualization from uh, all that you've practiced so far with Indrik? And how do we do this? So let's grab this same code, which we know for female married, female single, male married, male single, and then create maybe a bar chart for the averages. I think that would make sense. So then I'm going to chain the ggplot function, okay? So these three lines of code would give you this data frame. So in this data frame, we have gender, we have marital status, and we have the average wage. So take notice of that. So the ggplot already takes in this data. So we are just going to go straight and specify the aesthetics. 
So the aesthetics, I'm going to set X to gender and I'm going to set Y to the average wage. And then add a geom core layer. So when I run these lines of code, we're able to create a bar chart containing the average wage for females and males. But something is missing. If we still wanted to know out of the females how many are married, how many are single, and out of the males how many are married, how many are singles, then we can specify another aesthetic like color. For bar chart, it is fill. So fill for marital status. So that if you run this line of code, then default colors are chosen for you to know, right? The proportions of the average wages by uh, uh, married males and married females, married um, like that. So you see a legend that is created for you for the fill aesthetic that you passed in right there. So if you wanted to, this is a stacked column chart. If you wanted to create um, what a clustered, right? Then you would have to specify another position equals dodge in the geom call layer. And if you run it, you have clustered bar chart representing the average wages for married and single males and females, right? So when we get to ggplot2 later on, whether it will be taken by me or just like Indrake is doing, these are some of the things that you can be doing when it comes to data manipulation, right? So as it stands now, we've demonstrated to you everything that we need to know about tidy R and that of the dply R. And so I will thank you very much for uh, coming into this meeting. And if you want to reach me, that is my email and that's also my LinkedIn profile. So thank you very much.